All right, thank you so much, uh, everyone, for attending today's webinar, Unlocking Portfolio Optimization and Compliance Opportunities with Graph and, and ML. Um, want, just before we get started, just to let everybody know, we are recording today's session. Uh, you'll be receiving an email with a copy of the recording um, later this week. Feel free to ask any questions throughout the webinar. Um, there's a Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom meeting, and we will be happy to address those at the end or as we proceed through the webinar. Um, with that, if you have any issues during the webinar, uh, you can go ahead and message me, Xperio Internal. Um, I'll be happy to help you out. And um, with that, I do hope you enjoy today's presentation. I will go ahead and turn the mic over to Sebastian Good, the CEO of Xperio. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. It's actually three of us uh, gonna entertain you today and maybe teach you a little bit. Uh, my name is Sebastian, I'm the CEO of Xperio and uh, my background is in technology. So when I talk about stuff here, uh, I am looking forward to implementing it and building it and pulling that performance uh, lever um, that, that, that is the best usability feature in the world, in my opinion. I am joined by Graham Gansel, our head of data science. Hi, Graham. Hello, thank you for the intro. And I also have a technology background and I'm hoping Sebastian leaves some tech nerd knobs for me to talk about as well. That's right, that's right. And Edward, a frequent advisor and collaborator with Xperio is with us. Hi, Edward. All right, Edward is on mute this afternoon. So with that, let me just give you the, the two minute intro to who Xperio is in case you're not familiar with what we do. Xperia is a company that helps people build products. We help people build software products. Uh, our offerings are typically in, in one of three flavors. Either we are doing what we call a product factory where we're building some software for expert users. We do a ton of work in finance and capital markets, which is why we're here today. But we also draw patterns uh, in across other industries, including logistics, uh, retail, uh, and uh, uh, agribusiness, a few other places. Uh, we do a, quite a bit of machine learning and uh, analytics work in addition to producing uh, functioning software. And in a few key areas, we also have our own proprietary software we use as accelerators to deliver value to our clients in the area, specifically around financial crimes uh, and supply chain. And if, if those interest you, I definitely encourage you to uh, visit our website and learn a little bit more about them. Uh, in finance in particular, we focus on helping people build new products from the ground up. Often people are looking at uh, you know, new products being sold and traded, right? Everything over the counter and over the phone is becoming digital now. And so there's a huge uh, revolution in new digitization of existing uh, projects, of existing workflows, uh, new asset classes, new trading ideas, new markets, new everything. And we're at the forefront of building a lot of those pieces. Of course, this is also an industry that has not uh, uh, sat around idle over the last 30 years. There's a lot of legacy software providing tremendous value that is nonetheless a little bit old in the tooth or needs to respond to some of those uh, new market challenges. And so we're also involved in helping people modernize their, their legacy products in these capital markets. Uh, and then, of course, as part of all this work, there's a lot of work required to uh, bring in a lot of the promise of machine learning and modern data models and such. Uh, in, into the capital markets. And then, as I mentioned before, uh, around the areas of exploring data and exploring connected data, we have found a rich vein of usefulness in helping people fight crime and fight fraud and actually have some accelerators in those areas. Uh, just because people often meet us in one, at one angle and don't understand the other angles that we play at, uh, we work to complement your team uh, to build products uh, around all these different areas, whether it's around your actual product strategy or service design, helping digitize an entirely new workflow or build an entirely novel product, to tactical work around user experience design, the data science, engineering, machine learning, uh, and of course, the architecture and development required to build it. We'd love for you to call some of our references. Uh, Edward is one of them. He used to be a customer and he liked it so much he became an advisor, or at least that's the story he tells us when we invite him to our happy hours. And we've worked a lot all in- true. Uh, portfolio analytics, um, front office applications like uh, trading, back office applications like cash reconciliation, as well as sort of mobile, uh, large desktop. Uh, and we're a proud partner of OpenFin, who's a big participant in the desktop modernization world. All right. With that, who the heck is Xperio out of the way? We're going to jump into our topics for today. So we're talking in general about portfolio optimization with uh, machine learning. 
And we've divided it into these four topics. Uh, really, the key here is we're going to be talking about a series of steps and capabilities that are uh, required to really bring the full capabilities of a modern analytics and machine learning environment to bear. We often draw it as a pyramid to achieve machine learning driven, say visualizations, analytics results. You can't just start at the top with sort of humans amazingly basking in the glow of fully automated, fully smart market dominance, right? They have to be built up on a, on a foundation. The bottom of the foundation, of course, is a sensible set of business goals and strategy, as important as those are. We're not going to talk about them today. We're going to assume you already have uh, an end in mind. And in this case, it's achieving maximum portfolio uh, um, uh, performance or you know, minimizing compliance breaks, the things portfolio managers worry about. In order to make that possible, you need an infrastructure of data assets and infrastructure, right? So databases. Um, only then are you able to start building some of the analytics and data science uh, tools that you hear so much talk about. To release that to the world, to make sense of it, you need to deliver it to people, uh, typically through an application or a spreadsheet or a text message, right? The, the insights that you're manufacturing here have to be delivered. And then finally, the, the key to peak success here is to keep humans in the loop, as we call it, to make sure humans are able to use and take advantage uh, of, of, of all the infrastructure you've built for them and, you know, not let the robots run amok. So I'm going to start with a few topics. Uh, Graham's going to pick us up on the back half. And the first one I'm going to cover, Portfolios Ain't Spreadsheets, is really about what happens after you have some of these insights and speaks a little bit to the current state of the art in uh, applications that people are using uh, to manage their portfolios. Let's just start with this. How many people just want a super grid, best blotter they've ever built? And in fact, there's vendors out there, some really cool ones, adaptable AG grid. If you're a programmer, these are some of the tools you can bring to bear. Um, one of my favorite super grids, I don't know if you've heard of it, it's called Excel, super, uh, super awesome, very useful tool. Um, this is sort of the state of the art in a lot of portfolio management, which is, why don't you just give me a super grid? Give me a super blotter. Edward, how many times have we designed super blotters for people? Countless. And it seems Countless like we're always times. starting over from scratch. <clears throat> starting over from scratch. And it's like, oh, I need a filter on this column. And if only I could sort it by this. And if my backend database were faster and look. None of those are bad things. And yes, your traders have models in Excel that they want to export this to and, and put it back in to, to model their trades. But at Xperia, we look at the product development journey from multiple discipline point of views and from a user experience point of view, from a highlighting what's needed and getting to an answer perspective, not necessarily the most important place for us to start. I mean, that's super grid. Trust me, you can get some Xperia experts to come in and optimize the tar out of it, and it's going to be super fast and super awesome. But let's think about how people use it. As a portfolio manager, I want to say, what ratings changes today, last night, last week, whatever, might trigger a need for me to rebalance the portfolio? Ah, if I have a super grid, well, then I can select the portfolios I'm interested in, and then I can sort them by ratings, and then I can filter into the right class. And then finally, I can take a look. And well, what we call that is the chore factory, which is sort of this point of view that uh, where the computer is saying, hey, morning, Edward, welcome to your portfolio. I've left a few turds and skittles in there. I hope you find them. I've made your columns very clickable and fast. And this just doesn't really, this isn't really awesome for our users. And so what we really want to move to, and we're going to talk about in this uh, conversation today, is how the computers are supposed to be saving us work. Of course, there's gonna be a super grid because people are always gonna to wanna to explore how their data works and they're gonna to wanna to do sorts and filters and explorations like we haven't anticipated. But a lot of what they're doing with their portfolio, we're supposed to have been able to help them with. I should be able to tell them right there, hey, there's a compliance risk on this Mellon NY floating rate loan. Why? Click in, I'll explain it to you. I should do the lift for you, aggregating data across multiple portfolios. and where we're gonna talk a little bit about today, I should be able to suggest how you can take action here in this really uh, simple case. This, uh, this instrument has been downgraded. It's below a compliance uh, range for our portfolio. I need to sell it. That's the simplest possible case, but we'll see there's lots of other things that are much harder uh, for us to, to, to go figure out. So 
the the important thing to enable that sort of experience, what we really all want, rather than giving people a, a chore factory, is to be able to link cause and effect and link up your data, which really speaks to uh, item two in our little pyramid layer cake here, which is data infrastructure and what you're doing with all that expensive data you're paying for and all the data that your own proprietary systems uh, are generating. And, you know, Edward, we've drawn this picture a bunch of times. A very typical task for a PM is to come in for the day and say, ah, what's my cash position or how much cash do I need to put to work today? And, you know, how many systems are you typically going to have to look at to go do that? Even if you're looking at a single asset class, you're the fixed income guy and this guy on the next desk that's going to do the equities. I mean, it's a bunch of them, right? Yeah. You're, I mean, you're constantly spending time worrying about collecting the data and bringing that to you so that you have everything at your fingertips. Uh, things are changing rapidly. You're getting into new asset classes and you're struggling just to stay on top of the data and get it so that you can access, you know, access it. You're not really even thinking about the next steps, which are, you know, building the business rules so that you can really act on it in a timely manner uh, without having to go to kind of these specialized siloed systems. Yeah, and, it, and it's sort of um, uh, an outcome of the process I described before where so many more asset classes are becoming digitized and they're so much better, awesomer, specialized uh, software around each of these specific asset classes. But it's entirely reasonable to assume that you managing a portfolio will have a specialized system for managing your closed end funds, a specialized system for trading equities, another specialized system for you know certain derivatives and swaps. Uh, and yet you have an obligation to your investors to be able to manage the entire picture. Yeah. And so it's critical to be able to answer any of these questions or be able to make any recommendations to sort of <laughs> The first step is to admit you have a problem, right? You got to make sure you can pull the data out of those systems uh, into a common place in order to be able to start making the kind of recommendations uh, that we're going to talk about today. And so because we're talking a little bit more about recommendations and structured data today, we won't get as deep into this, but uh, Xperio is planning on uh, releasing some accelerators in this space because we've seen the problem so many times. But um, as notes here uh, for you guys, these are the most important attributes we see and we recommend in people putting together a data infrastructure um, to be able to start managing these sorts of recommendations and machine learning infrastructure to in improve the trading environment, to improve the portfolio management environment. So let's just go through them briefly here. Number one, you need to be able to assemble the data from these multiple transactional systems and a, a bi-temporal book of record. It's a $30 word for a pretty small concept, which is remembering what you knew when you knew it. And this is really important because a lot of what you know in this business is a time series of information. For instance, my treasury system may well spit out a predicted set of cash positions over the next seven days. So I have a time series of data. Of course, I have a time series. An obvious one would be, you know, uh, market ticks on an equity. But I may also have historical prices for some of my uh, more OTC uh, assets. And of course, because there's a bunch of transactional systems and there's, uh, there's custodians and there's guardians and there's all people involved in the process and the settlement, what I know is sometimes different than what I thought I knew before. I need to be able to record that, you know, yes, as of yesterday, I thought I had this position, but as of today, a break was found during settlement, it's been resolved and, and now I have this position. So I need to be able to look at the time series over time and allow comparisons between time uh, at a rapid way. Otherwise, it's just not practical to build some of this analytics infrastructure. Any thoughts, Edward, on the bitemporal nature of that book of record? Uh, I think you covered it pretty well, but uh, going back to kind of the asset classes as investors and uh, financial professionals have, have you know, gotten into additional asset classes, developed specialized software to help track that, price that, put that in their portfolio, it's added increased demands to kind of the operation side of the business. And um, over time, those asset class classes have become more liquid. They've had more participants. And so you don't have as much time really to analyze and maybe act on uh, the decisions you want to make as you did in the past. So you've got to bring that information into your portfolio management system for your more liquid assets. So that you can really analyze and look at your entire book of business, not just look at your liquid 
assets and then your, your, your illiquid or your new assets separately. You want to see, see everything together, which means you've got to tap into those specialized systems with their unique pricing feeds, their unique compliance modules, um, right. you know, underlying collateral data. And so once you've been able to do that, some very important things are made possible, which are sort of the minimum ante for some of the work that you need to do, you know, show me my change in NPV since today versus yesterday. That's what I get if I have a temporal database. But in order to make smart suggestions and model future optimization opportunities, both we and potentially a robot that we go train, which Graham's going to talk about, need to be able to evaluate these things side by side. And again, in an equities only world, in very, very liquid holdings, it's relatively easy to make some assumptions, throw them in a spreadsheet, I'm gonna have an idea, I'll execute it over the next minute, or the next 10 minutes, next hour even. Um, but some of these asset classes take you know, days or even weeks to clear. Some of the computations are entirely non-trivial and more to the point, some of the compliance obligations that we need to reach in a more sophisticated fixed income or CLO or other alternative portfolio you know, are non-trivial. and so. Uh, to have a practical infrastructure in order to be able to manage these analytics, I really need to make sure that my data infrastructure can support side-by-side -side scenarios. And a lot of systems we see, the troubles start with, I have a point of time. I have a great spreadsheet for today, but oh gosh, if I want to compare to yesterday, or gosh, I want to try a trade idea, I got to go do an export. I got to make a delta. I got to send it over to compliance, and then I got to put it all together. And we see all this sort of accidental complexity around managing all these reports versus what only amounts to moderate actual complexity of being able to look at these compliance rules and performance uh, analytics uh, there side by side. And uh, to Edward's point before, this is happening across uh, multiple asset classes, right? Yes, for your FX trading, yes, for your swaps, you're still gonna have specialized systems that let you put together specialized orders uh, for, for those kinds of those kinds of instruments. They'll have their own you know, protocols and their own reporting, but as the portfolio manager, I need to be able to see it all at once. Was, was talking to someone the other day in the business about how uh, frustrating it was that he could go to Fidelity, the consumer app, and he could hold a muni and he can hold an OTC, you know, derivative, a put, and he could look at his ETFs, his mutual funds and some individual YOLO stocks. Uh, and they're all in one blotter, all in one place. And he can see them all together at once and analyze them all as portions of his, of his portfolio. And he said, in a way, that's really a mile ahead of a lot of institutional systems, because while those institutional systems have much greater complexity and depth per asset class, <laughs> it's, they don't put it all together in one place. Um, and then finally, the thing that we see um, uh, quite often is as you get into alternative assets or as you get into more sophisticated strategies around risk management or compliance, you need to be able to represent the connections in the data. And this is really, in a way, the heart of the, your, your portfolio in a spreadsheet message, which is things like structured, you know, uh, uh, the CLOs, uh, OTC contracts have non-trivial internal uh, structure that you need to understand that needs to be readily uh, available to kind of the rules and analytics you're putting together. So where we're trying to get is from that sort of super grid mentality of collating multiple reports, facts to ideas that we're gonna be able to give you. Um, and generating those ideas is some of what Graham's gonna talk about. But I really wanna get to these sort of indicative sketches of user interfaces where yes, I can go look at risk exposure by country there in the middle, or I can look at concentration by investment type. But really brought up just as important to me are the recommendations that are falling out of the performance goals or, or compliance metrics uh, for that portfolio. That's where we're trying to get. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how the connections in the data are a key to unlocking uh, some of that agility and, and recommendations that Graham's going to talk about in a little bit. Uh, at its heart, what we want to be able to do is link cause and effect in our day-to-day -day work, right? And the first way I'm gonna talk about this is how the rules that you impose on yourself, that your lenders impose by way of their covenants uh, and, and that your compliance department imposes uh, by way of the you know, regulations that, that you're under or the risk management protocols that your firm is imposing, um, you need to understand how all those are linked from a cause and effect perspective. So the way this is typically implemented at um, you know, banks and funds that, that we go visit is, is in this sort of linear way. So 
for any piece of security, say a piece of fixed income, I can go get an objective truth about it from a data vendor, or maybe I have my own desk and I can get a feed from it. Something just traded at a price that's unequivocal. It has a rating or multiple ratings from bond agencies, and it has inherent characteristics like a coupon. These are facts that, that are starting points. Well, very quickly, there's a set of out of the box, and then for more sophisticated assets, custom analytics that you'll perform on them. So a yield to worst or uh, a beta as compared to some sort of uh, index. And then when I put these things together in a portfolio, I can then have analytics that are applicable not to a single security, but across a whole portfolio, such as an average duration or a tracking error to a benchmark. Uh, and then I want to start reporting attributes of the portfolio. And these typically start to be sort of the nouns that I use in my performance or uh, compliance conversations like what is the average duration of my non-investment grade utilities bonds, right? I've had to stack up a whole set of calculations to have that number uh, make any sense. And then usually I will either use it sort of as a guidepost, as a human, as I think about how to do my work, uh, or explicitly in some sort of rules engine, uh, or as, as part of a compliance objective, like I have to have a minimum percentage of this uh, fund in equities because that is my you know, target benchmark. Uh, or I need to avoid correlated borrowers uh, in, in a loan system, right? That aren't correlated in some obvious way. And then whenever one of these things goes wrong and opens up an opportunity for me to improve or fix the, the portfolio, I need to have someone explain why the rules have failed or how to satisfy them. And ultimately, I as a human, and what we'd like to see is I as a human helped by AI can understand what I ought to do to, to fix it. And the way we see this implemented in so many uh, shops is as a pipeline, right? So I get a data feed and maybe there's a specialized thread of my system that can let me see the grid light with those data feeds in real time. But really the heart of it is a nightly or hourly or end of market batch process that takes all that single security data, runs the analytics, runs the portfolio, and actually Going back to Fidelity is a perfect example. I can't get performance attribution for my portfolio except for the end of the month. I guess that was too expensive for them to compute. And I can't get yield calculations on my uh, municipal bonds except at the end of the day, right? There's just all these unnatural restrictions that are imposed by treating this uh, as, as a batch pipeline. And so as we look to helping people understand how to be more agile and take advantage of recommendations uh, in their management process, we see this data flow more as a graph, as a connection of connected data steps that can actually become much more lightweight so that I can now track, for instance, the impact of a single, let's say, bond downgrade. That's a piece of new information about a security that triggers another piece of analysis that rolls up to a portfolio, that rolls up to a comparable, and then results in a violation hey, this is a pension fund of flavor X, you're not allowed to hold any non-investment grade bonds. The way that that's typically managed now, and firms do get to these violations, of course they do, because they have to follow the rules, um, is through lots of laborious day before, day after. Hey, here's the report of what changed overnight. Here's your compliance report for overnight. Here's your ratings report overnight. Um, which is just driven by the immense cost of running this huge pipeline across all data every night, rather than what could be the much lighter weight and more agile cost of just tracing individual changes through this network of connected rules, and therefore just being able to backtrace or highlight the sorts of changes that brought you to your violation, or in trying out new problems and solutions and in an agile fashion, pushing them through those rules to see how they affect your, you know, say your portfolio analytics in order to score your trade. There's a lot of systems now where you have to go work that out on the side, pull up a sheet of paper to do it, pull up a spreadsheet, or God forbid, actually just enter the trade with a margin of error. Don't commit all your capital because you're pretty sure it's going to work. And then let that pipeline grind overnight and see how you did in the morning. Edward, we've talked about this a ton, how just being able to run through these rules faster is, is a game changer. Yeah, you had a good example of, you know, you can maybe try out a trade opportunity or two run it through your system, but you kind of already have to pre-qualify that idea. You have to have an idea it's probably going to work, and then you're going to send it through the rubber stamp. And maybe, you know, in the extreme case, uh, you might have to rework it. But what, what people really want to do is to iterate, right? Come yep. up to, you know, run several scenarios through the entire system to come out with, are they going to work or not? And then, on you know, beyond that, 
what is the best trade to make, right? How can I optimize for this? Firms have built really extensive processes for looking backwards and, you know, are you compliant? Have I hit my performance metrics? But now to, to, to you know, look forward, you want to utilize that tech stack that you've built to then generate a lot more, um, you know, simulation for different trades and in different asset mixes that you want to have going forward and have a better idea of what they're going to look like and not have to, you know, burden that down with tons and tons of assumptions. You want to use your real data, your real business rules. No, that, that's exactly right. And uh, when Graham uh, talks about how we can start doing adaptive learning to start uh, allowing the computer to assist humans in this kind of problem and solution creation uh, activity, which is at the heart of what they're paid to do. Um, you'll see that they require lots and lots of simulations. They need to try lots and lots of ideas and they need to only surface ideas that are useful, right? It's like a chess computer. You can use a chess computer to help you play chess, uh, but it better be able to evaluate moves quickly. It's no good sending an email to Magnus Carlsen saying, what does this move look like, right? You need to be able to evaluate thousands of them a minute in order to give some sensible high-grade ideas uh, to the portfolio manager. And this sort of ETL batch-based uh, pipeline of analytics calculations uh, is at odds with that approach that's required uh, mm -hmm. for machine learning. So this conversation that I've just uh, gone through here seems a little bit like a data infrastructure, data flow, kind of IT focused uh, message. You know, where's the machine learning in that? And I guess my message is, unless you have this sort of agile, you know, change only dependency aware uh, data infrastructure that can act on new ideas and new pricing very quickly, you're gonna find it very hard to get to sophisticated uh, suggestions in anything but very specialized spots. Like I'm sure your FX system is going to go give you great ideas for particular FX trades, but looking at it across a portfolio, multiple asset classes, if you're doing that FX trade because you're buying some fixed income, right? Seeing how that all works together won't really be easy unless, unless you can put this kind of infrastructure together. And that's often what we help companies do. So with that, Going to move to the next set of conversations, which is about how the data itself is connected, not just the rules, and how once you put all that together, you have an infrastructure uh, that can let you put humans in the loop of a machine learning process. And because I hate saying next slide, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Graham, to talk about the analytics. Thank you very much. And let me just dig in on some of those ideas um, about the solution space you just brought up, Sebastian. I'm going to talk through the details of the actual um, data structure before we get into the solution space, just to show you with concrete examples how this whole system is uh, constructed. As we've been uh, showing you over the course of this presentation, we are now sort of moving into this layer of analytics and decision making that will help support all of the decisions made by human analysts and portfolio managers. And uh, in one section later, I'll show you kind of how that stuff all fits together in an augmentative technology. Before we do anything related to the technology itself, I just want to highlight a couple of different types of problems that we see in this space with, with alternative investments and uh, assets that are uh, stru structured and nested, highly nested, um, through these uh, deep taxonomies that we see in the space. So again, a couple of examples of these types of assets on the left-hand side. And a couple of these uh, compliance rules that are also highly nested. As, supply, as uh, Sebastian just showed on those last slides there, um, these rules are, are, are complex and you can trace them back to um, various contexts within the connected data itself. So um, what we'll be looking at is a set of structured assets here that have a relationship to the other assets inside of individual portfolios and then across portfolios as well. And we'll show one example of uh, a highly nested and complex environment where we can very quickly leverage the structured nature, nature of the data to go ahead and try to identify and, and resolve some of the problems that we're seeing inside of those uh, individual um, asset holdings. This is a act, this is a real live example of a uh, graph-based data structure 
So this is a schema, it's a graph schema that we use to represent some of these assets. As you can see, not only are these, uh, is this data structure sort of nested hierarchically, it is actually um, recursive. So there you can have uh, sort of self-referencing information inside of this data structure. So for instance, um, you know, a, a tenant of a property may be an obligor on a loan um, that is in the same city or is actually the same tenant of that property. So you can see how complex this relationship gets. Um, and um, we're gonna show you how to kind of use that uh, what I would call topology, that's just the geometry of the stuff in this uh, data structure, to actually make decisions and then to help surface those decisions very quickly to a portfolio manager for uh, real-time action. We just showed the, the nested complexity and uh, what happens when you have individual components to structured assets, but there is also another dimension here, which is time. Over time, Portfolios evolve, of course, and the strategy here is to be able to guide and execute that evolution with some optimum strategy to, to achieve um, whatever your goal is, probably maximum profit there. And then just before I jump into um, the example, uh, the, the two examples that I'll show, in fact, um, wanted to mention that we do structure our information based on this FIBO ontology which is the ontology used across uh, various types of financial institutions to be able to exchange information in the same format. The benefit being that you can actually ingest information directly into this data structure that I've just showed on the last slide from anywhere across the business, as long as that structure conforms to uh, this FIBO ontology or uh, can be structured in that way, which is really interesting. And it's, it's helpful to exchange information so here is a cartoon example where we have a couple of portfolios made up of a few different instruments. Those instruments, again, are structured assets that are composed, of course, of backing securities that are, as we see here, owned perhaps in part uh, or, or affected in part by underlying um, obligees that have a um, you know, relationship to multiple instruments across multiple portfolios. And in a couple of slides, I'll dig into a, an example, concrete example of why that's important. So to lay it out here, before we look at the visual, another cartoon, um, we're looking at a portfolio management company who of course maintains portfolios composed of various asset classes. And we'll look at a couple of different examples here, um, uh, real estate and, and insurance bundles and um, the problem that we'll find and that we want to surface in the UI, which I'll, which Sebastian showed in an earlier slide, and I'll, I'll show another UI, another example UI here in a couple of slides, is that the backings or the, the support for all of these instruments turns out to, or many of these instruments, turns out to be more heavily weighted in one sector than is obvious to at first blush. So if you're a portfolio manager or if you're a portfolio management company trying to balance risk based on what sector you're exposed in, it may not be super obvious where that exposure lies. And this is kind of what this looks like in a cartoon sketch. So we have multiple portfolios over here composed of multiple instruments. And of course, those instruments touch uh, different components, obligors, obligees, there's um, geographies that need to be considered in compliance rules, of course. And uh, I've just boiled this down to a couple of different sectors here. And what we can see is if we trace back from whatever nested level of risk that we're interested in, these sectors here in this cartoon example, we can see that one in particular is a oops, I didn't double click the slide there, affects multiple types and multiple instrument types and thus multiple portfolios. And in fact, in this toy example, it affects all the portfolios under management here in this, um, in this example. So that could be a huge risk that is not super obvious when you only look at the first level here, um, which is you know what, which assets correspond to which portfolios. Drilling down, and not necessarily just down, as we as we showed earlier, these things are not just hierarchically nested. There are sort of cross links between them, like I showed in that data schema. 
we're able to um, very quickly, because it exists already in just preserved in our data structure, and see where those risks lie. And this is what you might look at in, in a UI. So for instance, this is um, the structure and, and um, members inside of a portfolio. We can see our uh, nice uh, super grid down here, as we were talking about earlier. And then the uh, connectedness of the data is surfaced um, to a certain extent inside of these uh, KPIs up top. And then as you can see here, we definitely expose some of that uh, topology information, right? Some of that, um, some of the connectedness directly into this UI so that users can have a little bit better and, and definitely faster snapshot of what they're looking at. The important part that I'm gonna jump into here in the next section is how we surface recommendations about uh, position swaps, trades to make for um, both compliance problems uh, to, to uh, stay ahead of compliance breaches or um, to maintain a continuous strategy across um, uh, trading strategy, uh, uh, across uh, portfolio management. So again, drilling down into the details here, again, Supergrid showed this slide earlier. We are surfacing information about the actual strategies he contained here in the data. And then in the, um, in the alerts panel, we have a couple of different uh, recommendations that are made to that portfolio manager. Um, one other example of highlighting uh, risk, here's just a, a flag here. Uh, there's a potential compliance breach here with this trade. And again, because all of this data is structured in that graph structured format that I showed earlier, this is a, this is a simple query on the back end, right? So you, you actually can get this stuff, as Sebastian was mentioning, um, in near real time. Uh, and so it's right there at your fingertips. You can try multiple um, what if scenarios and uh, see what comes out. And uh, rather than sort of, again, waiting for an email to come back from compliance and testing two ideas a day, uh, maybe using this system, you can, you can test a dozen ideas a day or more. So how do we use this graph structured information to make recommendations in the first place? And then how do we use the domain expertise of our portfolio managers as they interact with this system to come up with better and better and more beneficial uh, solutions and strategies moving forward on in time as the strategies evolve and as the market dynamics shift over time. There we go. Um, so here we are jumping into the last section of the pyramid. This is the sort of pinnacle of the, of the uh, power of using a connected data system with some analytics sitting on top. And again, that is incorporating domain expertise from portfolio managers, from compliance officers into the actual analytics in order to ensure those analytics correspond to feasible and beneficial behaviors as output from the system. This is a, a sketch of how such a system works. So on the input side, at the top of the slide, what we have here is a variety of data sources. And part of the beauty of using this connected data system is that those data sources can really be anything that you wish we can connect, we can make the connections in the data as part of the processing sequence, which goes into the decision engines. And I'm using the, the, the decision engine in quotes here because what we really mean is any, any system of analytics, including just rules uh, that you have encoded into, in business logic, we incorporate all of those things here in this middle layer in a, an effort to uh, combine all the knowledge that we can, right? So assuming that we have a, an optim a portfolio optimization engine in place already, we integrate those outputs. Let's say we have a, a statistical model that's operating, uh, you know, maybe using machine learning to make decisions, recommendations to front end, that's piped into the engine. Um, and then of course, as we've shown in the earlier parts of this presentation, we can use that connected data, those algorithms that sit on top of that connected data as yet another recommendation into a holistic or what we call composite decision engine, which that's, this is the thing that surfaces those recommendations into the UI that you just saw two slides ago. That's not where the cycle ends though. And again, 
this is the most powerful part of a system like this. We surface not only the, the recommendations, but also an ability for a user, a portfolio manager to say, yes, that was a good recommendation, thank you, or that was a bad recommendation, don't show me that one again. And we expose it alongside explanatory reasoning that's output from these machine learning systems so that the, the user has the ability to understand why the decision was made and to make recommendations back into the system. That's ingested into our machine learning model. And that is how the model updates over time and makes smarter decisions. So here's just a, a cartoon example of, of what that would look like. So we're recommending a swap and our portfolio manager here, the user in the, in the bottom right-hand side of this slide says, hey, actually, you know, if maybe we wanna use Euro instead, like maybe we wanna make a different decision. And uh, that feedback actually contributes in two different ways to this system. One is through an automated retraining cycle where we, we just have a, um, the result of that output uh, that, the, that the user has, has generated. And um, we replicate it a few times and we retrain a model. Or in this sort of manual mode, this is where you, your quants get involved. They actually can change the inputs to the system. Or if they have uh, some, let's do it in the business we call feature engineering pipeline. This is where they're generating um, raw features to go into the model. They can change that stuff and then retrain the model, which is the thing that feeds the front end. And thus that sort of feedback cycle is completed and the, uh, the accuracies will improve over time. One of the ways that we expose performance, not to portfolio managers, but to quants and to data scientists is through an investigation of how the models are performing. I won't dig into this in detail, uh, but if you're interested, please do reach out to me, contact info on the last slide in the presentation. Be happy to talk through how we use interpretability metrics and machine learning to um, help our quants and data scientists understand how, how to change your models and, and actually make better, better models, making smarter decisions. So um, there are a few, there's four pieces of this layer cake uh, in sort of making this fully adaptive online system. The first is just monitoring, just seeing what's going on inside of your app and inside of your data. And we've talked a lot about that today, connected data and then ingesting user feedback and monitoring that stuff. The second part is having a pipeline to be able to deploy that machine learning system that makes the recommendations. The next uh, more complex and, and uh, more powerful piece is the active learning component. That's the thing that has the ability to to automate it, to update the system in an automated way that we just showed two slides ago. And the final piece of this puzzle is interpretability. It's explainable AI. It is explanatory reasoning about why the system is making the recommendations it's making. And once you have all of these four pieces together in your product, what you get is that fully uh, adaptive Situ uh, a setting where you have an augmentative system that operates alongside your portfolio managers and both system and portfolio manager become smarter and faster together, just like in the example of the um, online chess engine. Uh, both player and system are continuously adapting and, and getting better uh, and uh, working together to win the game. So it does take completing this, uh, building this stuff does take a considerable amount of human feedback of uh, portfolio manager feedback. Um, and as Sebastian mentioned, we can actually simulate some of this stuff, right? Market data is public to a certain extent, some of it is. And um, what we do is we build essentially a feedback engine, which allows the ingestion of those uh, domain expert signals into the system. And over time, what we see through a setting I'll show you here in a couple slides, that that system does adapt and it does get better over time. And what's the purpose? So we have a couple different reasons for doing this. The first is that we have an ease of workflow. So rather than, as I mentioned earlier, if you can only try out two scenarios a day, I want to, I want to try this trade, is this going to go through compliance? 
I mean, was this a good recommendation? Should I even evaluate this? Um, this type of system actually balances the output of number of erroneous recommendations against the, the, the beneficial recommendations and solutions that are output. And we can, we can tune that system. And, and indeed, as we just showed with, with simulation, we can make sure that those, um, that balance is, is optimal. And hey, Graham, let me add something real quick to that, which is, you know, we do a lot of um, service design and user experience design here at Xperia. And when we go interview people like portfolio managers, and it's a pattern we see across multiple industries, by the way, people that are exploring for natural uh, uh, resources find the same thing. Say, so what do you spend your time doing? And we just get a, a flurry of discussion about special systems and reports and spreadsheets and like, when you really peel it all back, they're spending 60% of their time looking for data, collating data, and trying out little ideas, rather than what you, in theory, pay these guys for, uh, which is market insights. They should be thinking about new ideas. They should be sort of, quote, thinking big thoughts, right? Not wrestling small spreadsheets. And so by, by pushing a set of ideas and by pushing a set of quick calculators to them, you're radically changing kind of the product itself that they use in a way that you can't just achieve by making that faster grid. You're achieving a truly different position where this person is a strategist rather than a tactician. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's it, this. That's the point that uh, we, we make here in this second balancing thing. The idea is as you change your sort of interaction with the system to be uh, one of exploration and um, and high level thinking rather than uh, sort of um, uh, just a, a lot of experimentation on unrealistic or, or infeasible or, or unproductive strategies. Um, in this case, uh, just actually tr making trades. Um, what you what you are able to do is sort of balance the cost of human capital against the the gain of beneficial trades. And, and indeed there is a sort of optimal balance there, right? Um, and so it's really interesting to see as you use a system like this, how you can kind of fine tune that and let the system with human feedback fall into this natural uh, balance point that, that allows both system and human uh, to be most productive. This, the last thing I want to talk about here is, is just a quick mention on this on how this whole thing works. And I won't dive too deeply into the technical specifics um, because it might put some people to sleep, but I think it's fascinating. So I'll give you the analogy here. Um, what, we, what we have done over the past, um, let's say, I guess uh, it's been really in practice here in the trading domain since about 2012. Um, and is now being integrated into this uh, human in the loop domain is the idea that we can train an agent, an automated agent, uh, to, to understand not only what is happening in an environment, in this case, it's Mario, but in the case of our portfolio manager, it's, it's trades, you know, executing trades. Um, we can actually uh, enable that agent to understand the environment itself at future time. So making predictions and making strategic decisions about what's gonna go on based on what that agent knows, has learned is, is likely to happen in the future. So in the case of Mario, um, the, the agent plays millions of games of Mario and, and learns that it needs to jump over the mushroom dude, it needs to hit the, the coin boxes and the scores will go up and up. Well, analogously, what we use the um, what we use this reinforcement feedback cycle for in our human in the loop system is it, as a platform to understand the actions that portfolio managers have taken in the past, which have been successful, which have been unsuccessful, and which have been most fruitful uh, the most number of times. From those historical examples this system is actually able to make inferences, predictions about what's going to happen 
in the future. And that is the core driving that human in the loop cycle. Let me add something about that, uh, Graham, as well, which is it's often easy to look at one of these things and think, oh, sure, the machine's going to learn to market. You're just teaching another machine how to trade. Well, you could do that. And of course, people have been doing that for a long time. But what we find in this reinforcement learning context, in the context of these sort of sophisticated decision-making systems that we're talking about, is not so much that these reinforcement agents, as we call them here, these planning agents, learn to trade the market. It's that they learn to think like the people who trained them. So as an example, we work with companies who are managing multinational supply chains for pharmaceuticals. Just like how do I fix my portfolio? How do I get, you know, I don't know, vaccines to Colombia by a certain date? is a basically unbounded problem space. Oh, you could make more vaccine. You could package someone else's vaccine for Columbia. You could throw this away and buy this instead, right? How do I get more equities into my portfolio? Well, <laughs> let me introduce you to the public markets. Man, there's a lot of equities you could buy, right? That's a that's a very difficult unbounded problem space. It's not particularly productive to throw your, uh, to, to bang your head against, but learning how Frank or Jane makes decisions in those contexts is enormously valuable because then you can make Frank and Jane or people that are training up to be like them much, much more productive. So it's, it's as much about learning and improving about becoming sort of an apprentice or an assistant than it is about becoming some sort of enlightened, you know, Star Trek AI that's going to trade by himself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good call out. Good call out. Um, I will actually turn it back over to you, Sebastian, for the next couple of slides here to wrap us up. All right, great. Let me uh, advance to where you were. Sorry, should have been prepared for that. Um, can you stop sharing, please? And talk about how um, we've laid out this whole stack of um, requirements that are really needed to get you to that final Super Mario trading assistant where there's no realistic chance to train on thousands of ideas and explore that unbounded solution space unless I can get the connections of the data and the connections of the rules in a scenario aware sort of temporal database to try things out. It's just not practically gonna happen unless we can get that infrastructure in place, which is why we talked so much about it. And then there's an opportunity to get that analytics and, and uh, human in the loop experience to make a much more productive system for a portfolio manager. And ultimately what we should see will look a little bit less like this, the so-called super blotter chore factory, where we just welcome users to click themselves to death looking for ideas, not shown on this screen, many cups of coffee, many pads of paper, many Excel spreadsheets and copy paste tricks that are passed down from father to son, and try to get to a world more like this, where we are temporally aware, we're able to make predictions and understandings into the past, into the future, where a machine is helping highlight the kinds of KPIs that we've been using to fix our portfolios and explore that unbounded problem space uh, and give us particular recommendations uh, that we can go act on. Either because it's actually fairly easy to go get those recommendations out of a connected data, data structure, or because we've started to be able to use sophisticated you know, reinforcement learning to see what people have done uh, to fix certain kinds of problems with an awareness of the performance and compliance rules that have been put in place. Hope it has been interesting to you guys. Uh, if you visit our website or are watching this on the recording, I uh, definitely welcome you to come uh, click on our website, learn a bit uh, about what we do uh, in financial services, both inside and outside of capital markets. And we will and there, if anyone has any uh, questions, uh, please drop them in the QA box. Otherwise, hope you guys have a great rest of your afternoon. Thanks, Sebastian. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks. thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.